we all know, I'm sure you've had consumers saying, I want 47 ribeyes out of my, you know, quarter of, of beef I just bought from you. And, you know, it's mind blowing. So knowing this piece of it and, and understanding it, we know that you get, you know, about 29, 30% of the animal is from the chuck itself. The rib, those metal meats are ever so, so expensive and so lucrative. And then of course that round. So you're looking at about over 50% are coming from these two end meats. We know where this stuff is going. We know those are steaks. We know those are a few roasts here and there amongst these three subprimals. But this, what do we do with this? And the industry did a huge muscle profiling study back in the year 2000, 20 years ago. And they broke apart 35 different muscles. And we're going to learn some of these muscles. I'm sure you've heard of them. I'm sure you've seen them. But how do they fit into everyday life? and what you do and how you can bridge that with the consumer. So we're gonna start out with the chuck, all right? Very simple graphic here. And what we're gonna look at is that chuck roll and that chuck eye, whoop, and that chuck eye. Let me go back one. Um, we're gonna look at the chuck roll and the chuck eye that's coming from here. One is on one side of the scapula, one is on the other side. And this is where a lot of awesome cuts came from. Because let's face it, that chuck, once upon a time, 30% of the animal was either your pot roast or your grind, and it was totally wasted. So they did those muscle profiling studies and really um, put some value to that carcass. So taking a look at all of these cuts, these are all retail cuts out there in one form or another that is available. Maybe not in every single store, but maybe you have some of them itself from like the arm roast and the seven bone chuck roast and the blade and, and all of these other, but all of a sudden you see these little cuts here that have the green diamond. And those were the diamonds in the rough that the industry called it once upon a time when they did that muscle profiling study. Before it was all incorporated into some of these cuts here. So look, if you can see my cursor on that seven bone chuck roast, you see this cut right here that is actually the flat iron right here. It's just, just a little different look to it. So here, this was number two in tenderness and it was stuck in a bunch of really tough muscles. So taking a look at that, when they broke it apart, all of a sudden you take this out, you got number two in tenderness and the whole carcass and it's in the chuck. And what else they found was the Denver steak, which is number four, the ranch, number 10, and then the shoulder petite tender, which is number seven. They also call it the terrace major. Right now, this will never be found in retail. It's not in any grocery store. You guys will have it when you, you know, um, cut up and your carcass, but this will never be found in retail because this goes directly to food service because of that tenderness and because of what they can do with that, that, uh, that cut of meat. But taking a look at all that you can get from that chuck, it's mind blowing. I mean, three, six, nine, twelve, fifteen 15 different options there. But again, you can't have them all. So you got to kind of pick and choose to some extent. So looking at how this chuck, uh, this whole primal it is, there's di five different aspects to it. There's the shoulder quad. There's the chuck roll that I explained to you um, about that we're going to be looking at. And then there's the tender, chuck tender, the square cut, and then the short ribs. And the short ribs speak for themselves. But for the most part, I have no idea where that line just came from, but it just appeared. Um, but for the most part, this is what we're going to talk about are these two pieces um, of the subprimal. So taking a look at that shoulder clad, and this number right here is indicative of the IMS and NAMS numbers, the USDA number that is um, that is used by retail and food service. Uh, you can uh, thank our, our friend um, Steve Olson, a New York beef producer who worked with USDA for over 25 years, that he actually created these pictures and these numbers that go with these cuts. And again, I have no idea where that line came from, but we're just going to roll with it. So in essence, um, this shoulder clod can be broken down into that top blade, an arm roast, and the shoulder petite tender. All right. So if you cut this, you're going to go and get this top blade, and there's the, the coveted flat iron steaks. When I entered the industry 15 years ago, that was five years after that muscle profiling study, these flat irons were $3.50 a pound. Now they're about $8.50 to 9 bucks a pound in the, in the grocery store, and that's not even for Angus. That's 
that's just your regular choice brand. So this is quite the value these days. That armrest is all of a sudden kind of can be broken down into a clod heart or the shoulder center. And then those can be cut down into slices into those ranch steaks. And if you remember those ranch, I believe are number 10 in tenderness. And then here's the petite tender. You get two out of an animal, one from each side. They're about three, four pounds roughly. And um, of course, that one is number seven in tenderness. Save it for yourself. Save it for some of your great customers. They're great medallions. But again, you're not getting a lot from it. You're just getting what you can. And then as far as that top plate, you're only getting um, basically two from each side. And you probably get about eight steaks from it. And then where I, I brought this in is these cut charts that kind of show you that flow and that schematic can all be found on beefitswhatsfordinner.com in the cutting guides area. And I'll show you some more of them later, a little bit closer, but it'll show you, this is something you can share with your processors, um, your packers that you use, USDA or custom cutters otherwise, that's showing that, hey, here is that clod. And this is how you break down to get the petite shoulder tender. This is how you get the flat irons. This is how you get the ranch steaks. And it breaks it down into those cuttings. Not only do those infographics lie on Beef and Swiss for Dinner, but there's also videos too that your processor can go to or you yourself can go to for a better education. I'm going to the chuck roll. Here it's 116A. You've got two options here. It breaks down, this is the subprimal that breaks down into a chuck eye roll and then the underblade roast. Cutting this up, it's nice, uh, could be a nice roast. You break, break it down, or you can go ahead and create some awesome chuck eye roll steaks. These slow cooked are phenomenal. You can go ahead and marinate them and they're awesome on the grill. And then the underblade rolls can be broken down to that Denver cut. Remember what I said, that Denver is number four in tenderness. Awesome on a menu at a restaurant, awesome for yourselves or your consumer, and it's a great talking point that if they break that down. And again, looking at that chuck roll, they'll show you also what's there that we didn't cover is there's some other cuts. The Sierra cut looks and acts just like a flank steak. So if you're looking for that particular cut, they'll show you exactly where to get it, where to cut it from, if you're wanting to push that, that flank piece of it. If that's what you're looking for, depending on what custom base you want to hit. There is a Delmonico steak from the Chuck. So Chuck Delmonico, it's right near and it butts into where that rib is. That's why it can be called that Delmonico. It is very tender and even considering it is from the Chuck. And then you can get some nice roasts. They're small roasts, two, three pounds, cook off real fast, they're phenomenal. When these cuts came out initially um, after the um, cutting profile that was done by uh, Beef It's What's For Dinner, National Climate Beef Association, what they found is that um, it was pushed towards food service initially, because usually some things take off in food service and then hit retail. So once all those muscle profiling cuts came out, the flat iron, the petite, uh, petite shoulder tender, the Denver cut, and the industry said, hey, we've got these new steaks. Everybody was like, yeah, where did they come from? And it was just breaking down those multi-muscles in those larger muscles of the chuck and the round. Hey, Jean, one question was, when was that study done? I know it was um, relatively recently. No, actually it was in the year 2000. And it was a five-year overnight success. It literally took five years for food service and retail to totally grasp on the fact that the beef industry was proclaiming they had new steaks. And all they could think of was to just grow an extra appendage to the animal. Where are you creating new steaks from something that has been around forever and ever? So literally the profile was done and rolled out in the year 2000. I came into the beef council in 2005 and that's when they were really starting to push heavy and hard on all of these new cuts, but it took five years in the making for it all to happen. And now 15 years later, like I said, 15 years ago, that flat iron sold for 350 a pound. Oh my God, it was amazing. And now it's 899 a pound, I think at Price Chopper that I saw the last time. So that's kind of crazy. Other, um, also from the chuck is that short rib. Taking a look, short ribs are becoming hot and heavy because of the Food Network. 
People are influenced by that. And now with COVID and people are starting to stay home and cook more, they're going to look for some of these different aspects and items that you might have. Super tasty. They can be slow cooked. They can be braised. And people are looking to try and experiment. I always joke that at the beginning of COVID, everybody was burning oatmeal and cold cereal. And now they're making, you know, they're like all Julia Childs at home now. But that short rib has suddenly become very lucrative to you to you as well to break it down into these two um, um, cuts and cells. Now this right here I want to share with you quickly. This beef book I'll show you later is um, from North American Meat Institute. It's $50. I will share the link with you later. This is where I got a lot of the information and what I'm talking about is that you can't have it all. Because as you can see here, here's the shoulder clod and then here's the chuck wool. So if you have that clod and you decide that you're going to go the flat iron route and then you decide you're going to go this route, maybe this arm roast, it was a roast, but if you decide you want to go a little further with the steaks, you forgo the roast. And then here with the chuck roll, if you decided you want some underblade roast, you got the roast, but if you decide you want to cut it down into the Denver cut, you're going to have to forgo the roast. So it all depends on seasonality, all depends on your customer. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in depth as we move forward. So this is something to, to keep in mind. Um, and that I wanted to share with you quickly is, it kind of shows you how complex just one subprimal is. And when they broke down those muscles, ta-da, look at what you're getting. And it, it's amazing opportunity here. Now jumping to the round where the chuck had a lot of diamonds in the rough, the round, mm, they had a lot of muscles there, but let's face it, this piece of the animal is moving, these muscles are moving a 12 to 1400 pound steer and it's going to be tough no matter what. You have some extremely lean muscles. So the eye round steak and that eye round roast is one of the leanest cuts that we have per USDA guidelines. And then you've got your bottom round roast and your top round roast. For the most part, these are probably the most popular and the most understood by your consumer. And then whatever's left over, grind it. Just grind it. Add some fat from the chuck and the trim or wherever else you can add if you want to make it an 80-20 mix. But this is going to be super lean for yourselves and for your customers uh, as well. Hey, Jean, quick question. Yeah. I didn't put it in the chat, sure. but I want to stop before we go to the next slide. Can you go back one slide? Which of those steaks yeah. is the most tender? So if you're, because I have round, I found a little bit tougher and I found the bottom round steak a little better, but is there any data behind so, that? So one thing to remember um, when it comes to lean, according to USDA, lean definition is less than 95 milligrams of cholesterol, less than four and a half grams of saturated fat, and less than 10 grams of fat. And so anything from the round or the loin is considered lean by USDA standards. But when it comes to the round, whether it's the top round, eye round, bottom round, marination is the key. Marinate, marinate, marinate. Don't marinate for any more than 24 hours. And if your customers buy anything from the round, it's a 12 to 24 hour marination process, hands down. Um, because you, I back in the day, I mean, I grew up in food service. I spent 20 years in the food service industry, but I was a consumer. And you know, when I worked in food service, my beef came out of a box. I had no idea where it came from. It came out of a box, we cut it up, we did whatever we did with it. But when I went to the grocery store and I would look at that eye round steak and I'm like, wow, that's really lean. There's no fat. That's why I bought it. I would cook that eye round steak like I cooked a sirloin. And when I cooked the sirloin, it was awesome. I cooked the, the eye round steak without marinating, not knowing any better. And my husband's like, where did you get this? And then it was a disc to wherever I got it. Oh, I bought it here. Well, don't buy meat from there anymore. So yeah, and this is where our second one I will come in is those cuts and how to cook it and how to bridge that cookery gap with your consumer as well. So this one's kind of like telling you what those cuts are. That next seminar is going to be like, all right, you got an iron stick. This is what you're going to do with it. So it is the leanest, but it's also one of the toughest too. Does that help, Peter? Good. So here's the beef round, and there's actually three kind of main areas to that. So it's the sirloin tip, which is right here, and that gooseneck, that bottom round, and then the round, the top round untrimmed. So you can kind of see it here and how it's shaped. 
And uh, so this is kind of that primal, and then here are some of the subs. And looking at, so I'm going to take that first one, that A, that sirloin tip knuckle, and you can break it down into these roasts. Again, you want the roast, awesome, and then you can break it down to the steaks if you so choose. So one or the other, but you can't have both. You might be able to get maybe a, a roast or two, but then it may turn out to be some, uh, a lot more steaks and opportunity as well. Looking at that bottom round, you've got three different muscles within it. This one right here, there's what the industry through their muscle profiling calls the Merlot steak. Let me tell you, I don't think I marketed anything about the Merlot steak. The sheer force tests on it were, were not all that promising. They had to do a lot of tenderization to the round cuts that they found in the muscle profiling study. And it was right at that time where that, that tenderizing piece uh, um, aspect of beef was not well thought of. So the industry basically backed off and said, okay, let's look at those cuts from the eye round, the top round and the bottom round. And if you want to get fancy, maybe the Merlot. This Western steak right here that you see also called the Western griller, big steaks because they're coming from the round. Again, definite marinade and they have some great opportunities here. You marinate it, you can cut them into small strips and it'd be a great stir fry. So it's kind of knowing what to do with it and getting a little bit more invested. Um, I know some of you've had it cut this way and, and they're big steaks and you're like, what do I do with them? If you know that you're going to get that through your cut charts or through your processor, you have them cut it into thirds in, in a package or what have you. So that way your consumer can either break down that package or cook off the whole thing and use it in multi-day parts. And then the top round. Top round is actually, the top round cuts are probably number one in the Northeast. We love our AKA London broil in the Northeast. Um, the Santa Fe stick, again, from the muscle profiling, they gave them some sweet names, but you really don't see a lot of it. This is what you're seeing that you'll see in retail. Maybe you'll see some of this um, in retail, but for the most part, this is uh, a, this hunk of meat right here is getting cut into top rounds, maybe a few rows, and the rest is being ground down. So beef innovations, you can see this is kind of from the muscle profiling and how they broke it down. And you can see all of the different cuts they got from that muscle profiling. So from that shoulder clod, that's where they got the flat iron, the ranch steak, and that petite shoulder tender. Awesome cuts, super tender. In essence, they were support muscles in that chuck and not working muscles. So they just were there and they got nice and tender. Um, taking a look at that chuck roll, you got the uh, Sierra cut that looks and acts like a flank steak. Denver cut, number four in tenderness. The America's roast was something that they really touted about. You could roll up, tie it, and it was a nice roast that you could put in food service at a carving station. Um, the boneless style country style ribs. Hey, people don't always like to have bones with their ribs, so this was another marketing point. And then, of course, they'll the Monaco steak from the chuck. Here's a less expensive steak with a really pretty name on it that would go um, pretty good. And then here's the round. Like I said, very tough. They really had a difficult time in the industry marketing a lot of these cuts. The San Antonio cut, uh, the the Petit Tender, the Tucson, the Santa Fe, the Brazen, the Merlot, all of them great names didn't really go very far. You won't find a lot of information. You'll find them on Beef It's What's For Dinner, but you're not gonna find recipes that, that mirror with some of these steaks, especially, uh, cause I even looked myself, I'm like, wow, Western Grillers here, but there were no real recipes with that. Um, so it's something to consider to stick with what people know and that you know, and then go for the grinds, add the fat to make it a little bit more flavorful. All right, the fun ones, the middle meat. These are really easy, they're steaks. Um, you've got your sor sirloin right here. Breaking down, you've got the sirloin butt and the bottom, so the top and the bottom. There's actually some great interesting cuts coming from them. Um, they broke this down to the sirloin. You have your top sirloin roast and then your sirloin steak. This is the one that everybody knows and recognizes. But the top sirloin filet is pretty kind of cool because where these two, this steak comes from is right here. So what they've done is they've taken this cap, oops, sorry. They've taken this cap off, cut it up into its own set of steaks, 
And then what they do with this muscle right here is they literally cut it into thirds and then they go ahead and make these stakes. If they were to keep that whole subprimal together like this, they would cut it into thirds and create a top sirloin roast. So they're taking this big chunk of meat and they're creating opportunity here. All of this can be found in beef is what's for dinner. And then this cap, this kula, super tasty piece of meat. You've got to realize that the, the fiber, the, the muscle fibers on this part of the steak run one way and they run a different way here. So it's a different eating experience to eat this piece of the steak versus this piece of the steak. It's not bad. It's just a different eating experience if you're cutting it all the same because you want to cut across the grain and not with the grain. And when you do cut across the grain, it increases tenderness by one, one more step. So these culotte roasts kind of comes from that cap itself and these steaks are really tasting and really amazing. So it's something to consider. I put a little heart here because I have to say they're one of my favorites. And then the bottom. Can, can you clarify? We got a question. We got sirloin flap steaks. Um, is that from the cap? Where's those? Where are those flap steaks? Those flap steaks are. Or flap coming, tips. Yeah. Sorry. Yep, they're coming right up. So the, the flap steaks are part of the bottom sirloin butt. The sirloin butt of flap. So here it is. Here and here. Amazing. This is something that's really starting to hit within the last couple of years. I got to tell you, I found these at Costco in Syracuse uh, a few years ago, and it's one of the only steaks that I buy. My family loves them. It is extremely versatile. Um, they can cut them into smaller strips. I have used them that way. I've cut them up and did a stir fry. Uh, I've undercooked them a little bit on the grill, knowing that I was going to do something more with them the next day, maybe a fajita. But I got to tell you, these are amazing and I love them, love them, love them. Can't talk enough about them. Um, so highly recommend really kind of taking a look at those flaps because they're coming in and people are seeing them. And I think they're starting to be seen a little bit more in kind of like those network shows and, and cooking shows, but they're called sirloin bavettes, sirloin flaps, sirloin tips is what they're called. Um, unfortunately, our industry puts a lot of names on a lot of different steaks and that's what makes it super confusing. And if you go to another me, what's question on that one, Jean, another question was, what's the best way to cook it? Is it definitely something quick like grilling and or, yep. um, you All know, of anything? Stir fry? Yeah. So when it came to the end meat, other than the steaks, those really awesome, cool diamond and the rough steaks, those are all grillable. Anything from the chuck or the round, those are going to be slow cooked. You have to. They're, they're just too tough to eat as a regular steak. You can, but you have to marinate the heck out of them to get to that point. So you can grill a top round steak. You just have to make sure there's some major marination. But when we get to these middle, the sirloin and the loin and the rib, there it's all about grilling. There's no slow cooking. That is all on the grill, in the oven, broiler, cut them up, stir fry, you name it, but those should never be slow cooked because it, it, it's doing a disservice to, to the, the, the meat itself. Um, so we were on the bavettes. Um, definitely look into those possibilities. The petite sirloin, um, again, it's just cutting that big muscle a little bit smaller and making it more lucrative for smaller families and the smaller bites. Also a part of this, um, the sirloin butt is the tri-tip. Um, Tri-tip is hot, extremely popular roast. This is, would be the roast, and these are the steaks from it in the Southwest. They cannot get enough of the tri-tip in the Southwest. This is awesome for fajitas, awesome on the grill. Um, they die for this. This is the go-to in the Southwest for fajitas. Uh, the brisket, here it is. And there's two pieces to that brisket. There's the brisket point and the brisket flat half. The cool thing is, is you can kind of see it right here in that, that cut. The flat half is lean by USDA standards. The point, not so much. There's a little bit of more fat in that point, you know, probably at this piece or part of the animal, but that flat half is lean by USDA standards. So whenever I've done TV and we've done corned beef and cabbage or whatever, I always tell people go for the flat half and, and uh, St. Patrick's Day won't be as guilty for you. The flank. Okay, located right here. You know where that is. There's only this cut. 
You can see the, the multi striations right here. You're going to cut this one across the grain. Awesome for fajita meat, awesome for stir fries. You can cut this into thirds and have smaller steaks. Definitely marinate it. It'll be a little bit tough. So you're definitely going to have to marinate the flank. And then the plate itself, chefs like them because they absorb uh, marination. They're easy to work with. They're great for and very versatile in stir fries, fajitas, you name it. The hanger and the skirts are awesome. I know one uh, Mexican restaurant uh, nearby that he only uses the skirts. Um, it's more expensive for his fajitas to use the skirts, but um, he, he swears by them. And then, of course, you're getting into to the ribs and that hanging tender right there um, can be fun. Uh, again, these have to be marinated. Um, I don't know if you've heard of beef bacon lately. It's called Schmaken. Um, it uh, was a beef innovation not too long ago, years ago. And... Um, what they did is they took the plate right here and um, brined it, marinated it, you name it, cured it, and have made um, beef bacon, which is pretty good. We actually have some samples here at the Beef Council they sent us. And now the loin subprimal, again, super sweet area. It's the middle meat. They're super tender. They're just hanging there. These are non-working muscles. They're just keeping the animals' in, uh, organs together. And this is where you're going to get your porterhouse, your T-bone, your, your strip steaks, and your tenderloins. You can take this and make them roast or cut up the steaks, and the same with the rolls. Um, oftentimes, there's a lot of confusion amongst our consumers of what's the difference between a porterhouse and the T-bone. This piece right here is the strip that you see. This is the filet, and the difference is the size of the filet. So for it to be considered a porterhouse, the filet can be no less than one and a quarter inches um, across. And then the uh, filet here can be no less than a half inch to be considered um, a New York strip or a, a T-bone, I'm sorry. So that is the, those are your cuts from the loin. And again, you can go ahead and you can create the steaks, create the roast, one or the other. Um, you can have a mix, but uh, you limit what you, you offer to your consumer. And then the rib. There's a lot of opportunity here in the rib uh, for a lot of different reasons. you got your prime rib roast. you got your short ribs, back ribs. you got your cool tomahawk steaks, which is definitely a restaurant um, item. Even your cowboy steaks are a possibility um, or something that if you want to um, promote for summertime. And then the beloved ribeye steak, this is really cool. Here uh, is the, the ribeye itself. This cap right here is this. This cap right here is actually number three in tenderness. And uh, as the steak, it's awesome. You can get a ribeye roast like this for what, $10.99 a pound, $10.99 a pound, $11.99 a pound for that. Once you take this cap off in food service, or in retail, actually retailers kind of stub their toes on this because they don't know what to do it. This becomes a really expensive piece of meat because it's number three in tenderness. First is the filet, second is the flat iron, but this is number three. And all of a sudden it becomes $75 a pound when you're in Chicago. So not that I encourage you to charge for the cap ticket off of your ribeye and charge 75 bucks a pound, but just so you know, this is an awesome piece of meat. As sure some of you know, and you've made it for yourselves at home. But many years ago in 2013, 14, 15, when beef prices went bazonkers because of the drought and um, a decrease in cattle numbers, uh, the industry did, a, again, another kind of a muscle profiling. It was called beef alternative merchandising. It was called BAN. And this also still can be found on beefitswhatsfordinner.com. And they broke down this rib. So they peeled off the cap that you see here and then they kind of took that ribeye roll and they split it down the middle. I thought I was going to see a couple of retailers pass out when we were showing them this. And then what they did is they created these roasts. So they split it down and they were able to get probably one, two, three, four roasts out of it, probably about three pounds each. Um, or they took those roasts and then they started cutting ribeye fillets. Also very tender, very tasty in the sense that there is no kernel fat that's right here. So it's another option. 
we actually teach culinary students and even our New York um, bloggers to break this down as an opportunity to be your own butcher at home, but to create some awesome cuts during the holiday or during the grilling season by breaking this cap down and creating steaks, creating satays, which are like appetizers um, because it's so super, super tender. So those are thought processes to moving into the summer months when it comes to the rib and what to do with it. But most often than not, your customers are gonna look for this right here and that ribeye steak. Um, and again, one more reminder of that beef carcass looking at, hey, 30%, another 23%, almost, almost a little over half of that animal is in some major areas that is usually tough, but you can get some pretty cool meats and you don't have to grind it down. And then you can really capitalize on your rib and your loin and sirloin areas. So then the big question is, what do you do? Do you cut the roast? Do you grind it? Do you cut steaks? How do, you, how do you make this decision? How do you make this differentiation? What versus what? And a lot has to do with the season. What does your customer want? Is it summertime that you are processing this animal so you're gonna maybe wanna push some of the grounds and definitely the steaks? Is winter coming and you're gonna really wanna take some roast for those, crock, those uh, slow cooker opportunities or those roasting opportunities for the holidays? Is it autumn or again you want roast from the chuck and you definitely want chilies and stews and soups or is it the summer where people are looking for a, a, a steak that they can grill and make summer springtime salads because all of a sudden they got to fit into that bikini uh, come a few months away so you got to kind of take a look at when you're processing your animals what your freezers look like and who your customer is because that customer is changing where they were in the grocery store they're starting to move to the farmer's market or they're going online and shopping. So it's kind of knowing your customer because your customer is driving who you are, what you're doing, and, and that industry, and that's taking a huge shift. Once upon a time, we definitely used to be a producer-driven industry. When we shifted to that customer, beef demand went up 25%. You know, I often joke that if the consumer wanted a purple cow, y'all figure out how to grow one and create that niche for that consumer. So definitely, especially during COVID, this person is changing. They're starting to look at local a little bit more. They're starting to talk to you more. They're starting to want your product. So you gotta have to figure out a, a really good way of communicating to them, not only who you are, what you do, why you do what you do, but what you're actually giving them when you hand them that meat. And then you gotta play nice nice with your pack of your processor because hey you want certain cuts they have certain spec sheets and you've got to figure out a nice little middle area gray area that you can work together saying we need to think differently and that's going to be a constant working with your processor a lot of them are changing because they realize the consumer is changing and they realize the demand is there you also i know have a lot of a uh, hard time of one getting into some of these processors because they're book solid um, I encourage you to maybe call them and see if they have any openings because when things are booking up, people booked, but now once it comes to the, the time that their animals should be ready for the date, they're not, so they have to, to cancel. And I'm hearing some of that as well, that there's a lot of cancellations out there. Um, and then it's also sitting down and with your consumer and kind of figuring out or educating the consumer of not so much what they want, but what they should get and what would be more lucrative to them to have in their freezers. Here's a sample of a cut sheet, you know, and, you know, taking a, a look at, hey, you want to grind this all or do you want certain things? Here, they have a flat iron. Do you want it three quarters of an inch or an inch thick? Do you um, want some of the extras, the, the added value for stews? Do you want to grind the whole rib? Oh my God, I hope not. Um, or grind the whole loin? No, don't do it. Uh, the round, you may want to grind at least parts of it because you may want some roast, you may want some steaks, um, and definitely a half inch to three quarters for a top round steak is definitely smart. And to have an inch for a ribeye steak is definitely the way to go. Definitely an inch and a half. Um, I wouldn't go any, any higher than that, but it, 
I, and I wouldn't go any lower. I wouldn't do a three quarters of an inch on a ribeye. I would go an inch to an inch and a half and the same with the loin, inch to an inch and a half. Um, unless of course they're asking for a thin cut because maybe they like to fajita or stir fry or they like those thinner steaks. And it also depends on ethnic, uh, ethnicity as well. So your role now is that bridge builder, like I told you. You gotta build that bridge between your processor and the consumer because you know, here's this guy, he's just tossing things in. He has no idea. They're learning, they're still learning. And you know, you know your animal um, and you you know your processor, but now it's it's kind of bridging that gap in that conversation of what is demanded, what is needed, and how you're gonna fill that void, how you're gonna fill your freezer, that meat cake. The other role is you have now become a mini retailer. The retailer in, in any grocery store, they have to worry about shrink. They have to figure out what their consumer wants, what they're going to get, what time of year. I'm going to load more roasts in the, the fall and the winter and then take some of those roasts away and put more steaks in the, the meat case. You got to figure that out. When I worked in food service, I used to have four entrees to feed my consumers. I, I worked in schools and colleges and I had to figure out how many servings of each of those four different entrees that the, those students were gonna come and eat and make sure that I had enough, but not too much. And that's become your new role. Not only do you have to figure out how many animals to raise and when they're ready, but then you gotta figure out what you're gonna yield from them and if that consumer is gonna actually take those cuts. So they don't sit on a pallet in a freezer someday thinking, what am I gonna do with them? And then give them away because you can't get rid of them. So that's another thing to really, really think about is that consumer that you're serving and what they really want. And good old friend Steve Olson said, you, you know, you're doing this steer a true disservice by cutting it poorly. Um, Steve, like I said, worked with USDA for a number of years. We took him on a tour of a um, meat pad processing plant uh, with a bunch of vloggers, and he really pointed it out that you know, you spend so much time and energy and money and passion raising this animal that at the end of the day, when you process it, if it's processed poorly, you know, you, you, you did a disservice to that poor animal. And uh, you want to make sure that you have those lucrative cuts, that they're consistent because that's what the consumer is looking for. So resources. Beef is what's for dinner. I'll show you briefly uh, in a minute. Another one is beefresearch.org. They've got this uh, uh, product quality tab. You've got to check out. They'll talk about tenderness. They'll talk about the muscle profiling studies that were done. Um, some great information. All um, this was funded by your beef checkoff dollars. So definitely check it out. Here's information on beef sustainability and nutrition. Great talking points. There's even more here on beef is what's for dinner because there's recipes, there's cooking, there's cuts, there's nutrition and sustainability. Of course, New York Beef Council, we can give you cut charts and some pamphlets depending on the seasonality um, to help your consumer with some recipe ideas and kind of introduce them to the cuts and what to do with them. And then as I mentioned before that beef book, um, you can go to the North American Meat Institute, um, unaberry.com. I believe it's $50 um, and uh, relatively, uh, it, it breaks everything down. The industry, the flow of it, it'll be kind of like your pocket protector uh, when you're at a farmer's market. You got to look something up super quick. And hey, Jean, another while you're on that slide, I was just going to add, Chrissy brought up a great point about sharing some of these raw um, pictures and meat cuts to be able to, you know, share on their social media and things like that. There is a hub that's available through Beef It's What's For Dinner um, that is typically utilized by food service or larger scale retailers, but I do have a login and password that I can share with all of you and I will send that out after the webinar um, to make sure that you have that available. And I know on Monday on our social channel, especially um, Facebook and possibly Instagram, we always do a meat cut Monday. So what um, I've asked Ryan to do is, you know, profile a, a meat cut and a recipe that goes with it. So you see a raw and a cooked version of it. And then there's usually a link to um, the recipe on beef that works for dinner or one of the bloggers who, who worked with and created that recipe. So 
definitely take a look at what we have on the New York Youth Council Facebook page. It's very consumer facing and feel free to share. Please do share all of that or interact with it. We do have a, a New York Beach checkoff page, and that's for you. Producer facing to see more of our resources and a lot of the stuff that we're doing on your behalf for, for the checkoff. And then YouTube, um, we're putting more and more videos on there on how to thaw ground beef, how to cook frozen meat and stuff because you do sell frozen meats. Um, how to cook, um, how to thaw out ground beef, how to thaw out cuts and stuff. That is not only on our Facebook or our YouTube channels, but it's also available on the Beef It's What's for Dinner one as well. So definitely look into that. Save the date for the next one. We'll talk about marketing and cooking underutilized cuts. I know this. I can do this one in my sleep after 20 years in food service. I know how to, to break down that, that cut and create tasty meals and how to talk to that consumer about it. Because again, I was that goofy, stupid consumer that had no idea what to do with an eye round steak and a sirloin steak. So I've learned a lot and my steaks have much improved over 15 years. So after that, um, if you have any questions, I'm going to change my screen share a second here because I want to. So Jean, really quick, um, we did have one question in the chat before you move on. Can you touch again on the tri-tip roast versus the sirloin tip roast and what the differences are and also the cooking methods? All right, let me go back so I can get to it. This one right here. So here's the tri-tip tri -tip. versus the sirloin tip. Yep. Okay, so here's the, the bottom sirloin. You get the tri-tip, which is kind of like the um, the bottom part of, uh, let's see if I can get into the sirloin piece right here. So your tri-tip is coming from like right around here near the bottom of the sirloin itself. So it, it needs to be marinated. Like I said, super tasty. You don't need to slow cook this. You can marinate it, roast it uh, nice and slow, uh, dry roasting in the oven, uh, cut it up into steaks. Phenomenal tasting steaks. Again, marinate maybe six hours, no more than 12. And you can slap those on the grill. You can also cut it up, marinate the meat and create amazing fajitas. So this is an awesome fajita cut um, uh, for fajita meat. And then your the sirloin tip or those flaps, you don't even need to marinate those. It probably comes a little bit higher up here and um, it doesn't work as much. Awesome cut of meat, very fibrous, but Super, super tasty, fast cooking. I grill it all the time. I saute it. Um, by all means, I've cut it up into smaller pieces. I've sauteed it and stuffed peppers with it. So that is the versatility of this, the, uh, the sirloin flap of that. And then the tri-tips, I've cooked it as a roast and I've cut it up into steaks and I've cut it up into fajitas. All right, and let me do a screen share. So taking a look at, um, so this is beef it's what, oops, I help if I share. Okay, so beef it's what's for dinner.com. Going to the cuts page, <clears throat> here's your search engine. All you have to do is put in, let's say for instance, the loin. And it'll give you all those beautiful pictures I was showing you along the way. And clicking on to the strip loin boneless, uh, boneless, it'll explain what it is, where it is, cooking methods, and then cuts from this subprimal. You can click on right here, and it'll give you tons of recipes that you can go with. It'll give you those industry numbers that I had associated with them on the um, on the website. You can also do some sharing too. So you can share this cut on your own pages as well. So feel free to do that at any time. Um, and then here is a cutting video right here to how to, to strip petite roast and fillets that I showed you as some of the cuts that you can get from the uh, this subprimal. Uh, then, like I mentioned, whoop, sorry for that little flash. Here's the schematic I told you about that you can get off of Beef It's What's for Dinner with it. Here was the shoulder quad. 
and you can break it down that it'll take you to that top plate, that flat iron, and then it'll give you the petite tender to medallion to that ranch steak, and it'll it'll bring you to that. And then I'll even break down that flat iron a little bit more and how to um, fabricate that out. So pretty good that your processor should be able to follow without too too much issue. Um, the Sierra cut again that came from the chuck. Um, it acts talks, walks just like a flank steak, uh, but it's not, and it's coming from the chuck. And uh, the Delmonico from the chuck that I, I talked to you about, you can kind of see here was the uh, the chuck eye roll and where they cut it, fabricate it, and how they get, a, and then there's only a few. You can only get like maybe three uh, from that chuck eye roll itself. So those are limited as well. And then the shoulder clod itself, what you can gain from that shoulder clod um the breakdown of the flat iron and then the beef cut chart again downloadable from beef is what's for dinner or you can get it from us at the beef council and then the beef book can be found at the north american meat institute as i mentioned it's like what did i say 54 dollars we'll send it to you and it will on beef is what's for dinner you can find um, a lot of this stuff cut charts, cutting videos, cutting guides, all at the bottom of Beef is What's for Dinner under training um, and other resources. Well, have everyone have a good evening, stay warm, and uh, we'll be seeing you next month, if not sooner.